So, uh, good afternoon, good day, everybody. Uh, welcome to the 63rd monthly meeting of the Strong and Sustainable Business Model Group meeting. Um, we're very fortunate to have with us today uh, Manuel Man Manga and Fyodor Ovshirinechkov, uh, whose name I've probably just badly mangled, uh, from the In Institute for Evolutionary Leadership. Um, and they are going to uh, walk us through this presentation. We are recording today, so if you do not wish to be recorded, uh, you should leave the meeting now. Um, the agenda for today's meeting is available in uh, the um, in the wiki for the uh, for the Strong and Sustainable Business Model Group, and I am pasting the URL of today's agenda in the chat now. Okay, so with that, um, the agenda has a list of who's uh, attending. Uh, if you've just joined, please put your name and affiliation in the chat so that uh, I can add you to the minutes on the agenda, the bottom of the agenda in the wiki. Uh, so with that, Manuel, Fyodor, over to you. Great. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone, uh, depending where you are on the planet. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is Manuel Manga. And I am in Oakland, California. And thank you very much, Anthony, uh, for this invitation. And thank you very much for this strongly sustainable business uh, group. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure for me to uh, share with you uh, this uh, leadership competencies uh, in which we will go into that in a minute. So I am the co-founder and managing partner uh, of the Institute for Evolutionary Leadership here in Oakland. And previous to that, I was uh, doing a lot of leadership consulting and leadership development. I've worked a lot of, with uh, organizations, corporations, NGOs, governments, uh, teaching leadership for about the last 35 years. Um, and I've started developing this model of evolutionary leadership about 20 years ago. And it's a pleasure to be able to uh, share it with you. And, and from there, I'll pass it on to Fyodor. Yeah, thank you, Manuel. Um, I'm Fyodor of um, originally from Russia. Uh, so grew up in <laughs> Russia, uh, but now live in Oakland. So Manuel and I are in different parts of Oakland right now. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I've been working with Manuel since uh, uh, 2014. Uh, on the Institute uh, for Evolution Leadership, who, uh, which is an organization um, that uh, helps uh, further develop Manuel's model and uh, um, invite more people into the co-creation process. And so, you know, my role today is to tell you a little bit about that after Manuel talks about the model itself. Um, so um, my other affiliations include uh, I'm a board member and uh, lead instructor at Optimal Business Bootcamp, a cooperative business accelerator here in Oakland. Um, and I'm on another board uh, with uh, United Nations Association, San Francisco chapter. Um, and uh, I've uh, been actively involved over the last six years with the Academy of Management, Association of Management Scholars. Um, so and, uh, some people um, in sustainable business models might, might know some of those groups. Uh, but my uh, probably about 80% of my time is dedicated to the Institute uh, and uh, the work that I do with Manuel. So look forward to uh, this conversation today. And uh, thank you very much, Anthony, for, for the invitation. Great. Uh, thanks, Fyodor. Uh, okay, I'll start the presentation. And uh, I'll, I have many, several slides here that I want to present with you and go over with you to explain uh, primarily the leadership competencies for desirable and feasible futures. And uh, I think uh, by the end of this presentation, I think you will have uh, a good sense that uh, we do have lots of knowledge, lots of competencies, lots of skills, uh, for being able to design desirable and feasible futures that are better for the planet, better for people, and better for everyone. Uh, so it's exciting to me to be able to contribute uh, to other people who wish and desire to design better futures for humanity, uh, not just for business or for organizations. 
Um, so, so these- Manuel, um, I just wanted to mention to people that um, uh, if you have questions as Manuel is speaking, perhaps put them in the chat. Um, this is usually, we found them usually easier to manage than uh, everybody trying to speak on top of each other. Uh, but uh, you're welcome to try, try that too. Uh, Manuel, I'll, I'll invite you to let people know how you'd like to handle questions. Uh, yes, I, I think what I'll do is, uh, if there's a question of clarification uh, the, the, on a slide, if there's a particular word or uh, concept that people would like me to explain on it, you know, to ex- explain it a little more, uh, write it in the chat. But I would say save the, the overarching questions and comments for the end of the presentation, which I'm hoping to be done in no more than 30 minutes, my part and Fyodor, his part in 10 minutes, so that we'll have plenty of time uh, for questions, comments, and collective learning. Uh, One of the things that we hope to promote is more uh, collaboration and collective learning. So, uh, So, yeah. So does that work, Anthony? Is that okay? I reply by the chat, yes. Yeah, okay, so I'll start. Um, So uh, if you have questions about the concepts, you know, write them in the chat. If you want to uh, have questions, overarching questions and comments, then save them towards the end. Okay, Uh, so where are we today? Hold on a second. Um, Fyodor. Yeah, you should be able to use the arrows. Yeah, I'm trying to, it's not going up or down. Uh, if, you, uh, if you go to PowerPoint again, uh, from Zoom, if you just- okay, hold on a second. If you click on the screen with a presentation and then, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, good. And then use arrows. Yeah. Perfect. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the the context, uh, what I'd like to uh, cover since this is an evolutionary perspective that we bring to leadership, evolutionary leadership has a particular approach, which is we look at the history of humanity, we look at the history of the modern world, but we also look at where are we today in the present and what do we need to do to create a more desirable future uh, for humanity and for the planet. So it has an evolutionary perspective. So it's asking people to think evolutionary, to think uh, big, big time. Uh, As some people would say, to think in terms of big history. Uh, Where do we come from as humanity? Where do we come from as humans? Uh, And where are we and where are we going? Uh, These are fundamental evolutionary uh, questions that every leader should be reflecting on and thinking about uh, rather than drifting along in evolution time and rather than drifting to a future that may not be good for us uh, humans or good for the planet. uh, We ask people to reflect, to think, to think big, uh, past, present, and future. So in this slide, uh, we look at the current state of the world and the industrial age, and we see that where there are, while there have been many uh, great uh, breakthroughs in the industrial age and great advances for humanity, we also have a great deal of threats. Um, so for example, I mean, uh, in terms of uh, advances, here we are using technology and using Zoom to connect people across time and geography to connect with each other. So that's wonderful. That's a, that's a great part of the industrial age, uh, this technology. At the same time, we are facing a great deal of threats. So here's a few of them, uh, not to paint the picture of doom and gloom, but in order for us to ground ourselves as leaders in current reality, one of the important 
factors of a good leader, an evolutionary leader, is that they understand the current reality. So in this picture, in this slide, we see that we are having a great deal of problems with species extinction, biodiversity, we're losing a rainforest, we're losing water, uh, et cetera. And also we have increasing trends that put humanity at risk, like global warming, um, CO2. And for sure, uh, people would say that the hurricanes that we are experiencing uh, this year, whether it's Hurricane Irma or Hurricane Harvey, are in some part influenced by global warming, by what we're doing to the planet. So these are very real threats that humanity is facing. Um, and besides that, we have things like Earth Incorporated, uh, unlimited growth, capitalism, toxic waste, fossil fuels, population growth. And scientists, people like Donella Meadows, who quoted, uh, I think, this term of overshoot, uh, she said many years ago, humanity is currently in overshoot. So in other words, we are doing to the planet beyond the carrying capacity of the planet. So in a way, the humanity today is not living in a sustainable manner. The, the civilization that we have is not sustainable. It's in overshoot. And for sure, we are warming up the planet. Our CO2 numbers have gone over 400 already. So those are threats that we need to deal with. Uh, and sadly, a lot of our leaders, institutional leaders, are not looking deeply at these threats. They are not looking deeply at these issues. And therefore, these problems continue and get worse. So we're going to understand why is it that the leadership in our, most of our organizations and institutions do not are able to understand and deal with this complexity, the complexity of these threats that we are facing. And one of the things that we're going to see is that these leaders were not trained to understand systems. They were not trained to understand evolution. They were not trained to understand planetary complexity, etc. So we have leaders who were not educated, prepared, to confront the complexity of the world that we have today. So we cannot just say, well, we cannot blame it. They are, they are, they are too much caught up in short-term, uh, narrow thinking, quarterly earnings. Uh, this is my problem, uh, my little society or my little country, and I don't have time for the big global issue. Uh, so this is a big, so in, in a sense, we have a leadership crisis. So the industrial age is primarily a result of uh, three big things, three big systems. One is institutions. The other one is culture. But at the bottom of all of those, we have worldviews. And the worldview that we have inherited uh, from the industrial age is no longer good for humanity or good for the planet. It's a dualistic, Cartesian uh, reductionistic uh, worldview that separates us from humans and from nature. So you, one could say that a major flaw in the current industrial age worldview is this feeling of that we are separate from others. We are separate from nature. We are not systemically interdependent. Uh, so that's a, that's a big fault in the, in the worldview. So if we want to evolve to a, a sustainability age, then we need to work on the evolution of three major things, a new worldview, a new culture, and new institutions. Now, the good news is that they are all feasible. So I, I love the title of the presentation because these are desirable and feasible things we can do. The good news is human beings can evolve their worldviews. They can change their mindsets. So that's, that's the good news. We can also change culture. And we can also change institutions. I'll give you an example 
of cultural change. I was reading this in a book recently. Uh, it says, 30 years ago, if you walked into a drugstore in America, you could buy cigarettes, but the, the, the condoms for birth control were behind the counter. You could not buy them. You had to ask people. So you could buy the cigarettes, but you could not buy the condoms. 30 years later, you can walk into a drugstore like Walmart, and you could buy now all the condoms you want, but not the cigarettes. So now the cigarettes are behind the counter. So, <laughs> so that's an example of how the culture changed. Why? Because people found out that cigarettes were producing cancer. And they were dangerous. So now you keep them out of the hands of children. Uh, and we want people to be sexually educated. So we give them more condoms. That's an example. There are many, many examples that cultures do change. So the next one, one of the things that distinguishes evolutionary leadership from other types of leadership is that we have an evolutionary purpose. We are purposely driven. Now, a lot of people in a lot of organizations function without purposes. They are not clear about what their purpose is. If they have one, uh, we think that humans are better off in organization when they have a clear, articulated purpose. Why do we exist? What's the reason for our existence? And so when I started designing evolutionary leadership about 20 years ago, I said, we need a new type of leaders that will get us out of this, uh, you could say, evolutionary crisis that we're in today, the threats that we're in today. So I began to compose this purpose that says, the purpose of evolutionary leadership is to facilitate a conscious psychological social evolution from the industrial age toward a just, sustainable, and flourishing world. So what we want is to be able to use our wisdom, our knowledge, to design a transition from the industrial age to a more just, sustainable, and flourishing world. And those three things are feasible, doable, achievable. So we're not talking here utopian scenarios. And evolutionary leadership is based on a new worldview that integrates the ecological, the biological, and the social dimensions of our life. So it's a very systemic uh, worldview. So it's not just about the ecology, it's not just about people, it's about both, and also that it takes into consideration our biological roots as human beings. So that's our purpose. And this is one of the things that I think distinguishes evolutionary leadership in our work from many other types of leadership whose purpose is often, um, you could say, not overt, not explicit. We have an explicit purpose. Now, what is the great transition that we're trying to facilitate and promote and contribute to? We're trying to facilitate this great transition from the industrial age to a sustainable age. And again, we say the work of evolutionary leaders is to promote uh, an evolution of mind, worldview, an evolution of institutions, and particularly something that we call systemic sustainability, and then promote a cultural evolution. Okay, again, there are many, many examples in the 20th century of cultural evolution. Um, the civil rights movement, uh, the women's rights movement, the gay rights movement, and of course, every time you have a big change in a culture, a big change in a society, you also have people uh, protesting or going against that evolution like we are seeing in America uh, today. Uh, but this is the process of cultural uh, evolution to create a more just, sustainable, and flourishing world. No one would say now that we don't want to have 
human rights across the world, for example. So, so that's the work of evolutionary leaders. Obviously, some people are going to focus on different parts of this great transition. Uh, it is important that as a leader, you understand the complexity that we're facing. So when you look at this slide and you say, wow, we have to get out from the evolutionary systemic crisis to a more just, sustainable, flourishing world, how do we do that? That's very complex. It is complex. So it takes not only having a different understanding of the world, and in this case, one could say understanding the complexity of the world, but also it takes, um, it, one could say, an understanding of humanity, understanding of human nature, human evolution. Where, how did we get here? And what can we do to go forward? Uh, so here in this slide, uh, there are five systems that I focus on, but my, by no means they are the only ones that we need to work on. Um, there may be others that appeal to you or are important to your work or to your own passion. But for sure, we need an evolution of human beings. Uh, we need an evolution of the sapiens that we are. We need a new mind and we need a new worldview. Uh, here, uh, we also, I point to that we need an evolution of culture, just like I mentioned earlier. Uh, we need a culture that is more just sustainable and flourishing. And I'm, I'm going to say something about that in another slide. And we need to transform our institutions. Now, there's plenty of work here, so there's no shortage of what people can do to contribute. So, for example, I would say that we need to transform our institution of education. The way that we go into education today, it is primarily to train people to have successful careers within the existing paradigm. We're not educating people to be global leaders or global citizens, for example, or to understand the complexity of our world today. You know, we're training people, get a job, be this, be that. Uh, so for sure, education is a major institution we need to transform. Uh, capitalism, the way capitalism exists today, it is not sustainable. Even Al Gore in his book, The Future, uh, clearly says, he calls it Earth Incorporated. That's a, that's a term that Al Gore uses. And capitalism, he says, needs to evolve to be sustainable capitalism. So who's going to do that? Well, you don't expect the people who are running the business today to immediately shift and say, well, I want to create sustainable capitalism. There's a lot of uh, barriers to that effort. Uh, we need to be able to understand those. Uh, and finally, we need to be able to have sustainable technologies. And the good news is we do have lots of breakthroughs in the technological arena. Uh, there are more and more people driving electric cars, for example. So, so electric cars are just one example of how we can use technology to create a better future, a sustainable uh, future. So when we ask people to apply the competencies to build a more desirable, sustainable future, it's an invitation. For some of you, you may say, my passion is technology. For some of you, maybe my passion is institutions. For some of you, maybe worldview. I like to transform people's worldview, um, et cetera. So there's plenty of room here for everyone. We don't expect one person to work on all of these. Now, how do we achieve this great transition? How do we influence our systems and institutions so that they evolve towards a just, sustainable, and flourishing world? Well, we do it by applying these seven competencies. So when I used to teach a lot of leadership development in many different corporations, in different uh, organizations, 
I would find that many organizations would have their own brand of competencies, uh, usually five, six, seven competencies. And those competencies were very good. And I used to teach those. I used to teach those at Boston College when I was an adjunct professor. I used to teach them in NGOs. Uh, and those competencies were good. However, they were not, in my opinion, they were, let me put it this way, they were more to, they were there to reinforce the current business paradigm, which I call effectiveness paradigm. Now, nothing wrong with being effective. We need effectiveness. But effectiveness just to produce more of the same is not what we need today in the world. So, uh, yes, we need effectiveness, but we need to have competencies that allow us to design a better future, to evolve consciously. So when I started doing the research, I put together uh, these seven competencies and each one of those competencies is critical for the evolution of worldviews, cultures, and institutions. So the first one is here that we call personal evolution worldview mindsets. So it starts with you as a person saying, I commit to evolving my own worldview or my own mindset. Uh, I'm going to say a little bit more about that. Uh, the second one, it deals with emotions and generative language. Uh, we are emotional linguistic humans, and it's important for us to know how we use that for the benefit of creating a better future, emotions and generative language. The third one is systems thinking. Uh, you could call it systems being, system thinking, um, because we live in systems, so we need to understand systems. Uh, the fourth one is systemic sustainability. And here in this competency, and I'll say a little more about this, we go beyond the traditional understanding of sustainability or sustainable development. And here we aim at a systemic transformation of the whole society, not just taking care of the ecology, etc. Then we have number five, ontological designing which basically puts each and every one of us in the role and responsibility of being a designer of systems, being a designer of futures, being, being a designer of the future of our civilization. And number six is adaptive work and collaboration. So why adaptive work and collaboration. In this particular competency, uh, I'm grateful to have studied with uh, Professor Ronald Heifetz, who teaches adaptive leadership at Harvard. And, uh, and he has contributed a great deal to this work that he calls adaptive work, uh, which, by the way, we need more of. Uh, one could say that, and with that, we need collaboration. So the fact that we're looking for leaders to collaborate, institutions to collaborate, is already a stretch for a lot of people, but most people are not used to collaborating. And the fifth, the seventh uh, competency has to do with wisdom and evolutionary scenarios, so ev evolutionary futures. We need wisdom. Uh, wisdom is beyond knowledge. Uh, and we don't have enough wisdom in our leaders today. So we need wisdom to guide us to a, a better future for humanity. So those are the seven. I'm going to go into a little detail in each and every one of them uh, because that's the heart of the presentation today. So the first one, uh, personal evolution, uh, is something that uh, it's a good news. And what do I mean by good news? Well, it's good news because humans are the animal who can reinvent itself. So that's one of the good things about human beings. We don't have to stick to be the same way that the culture molded us or the culture shaped us. We have the power 
and the possibility to choose how we evolve our own mind and our own consciousness. So uh, I draw a lot here from the work of Professor Robert Keegan, the Harvard psychologist, and also from the, uh, a mentor of mine, uh, the scientist Jonas Salk, who I had the pleasure to listen to uh, before he passed away. And he definitely said, we humans have the possibility to create a different evolution of mind. Uh, and I, I was trained originally as a psychologist. And so I know that it's possible and doable and it takes work. So here we ask uh, leaders to commit to creating a different mindset that you could say is more ecological, more sustainable, uh, more complexity, more systemic. Uh, and obviously we ask people to commit to applying these competencies to their work locally and globally. So that's the good news about personal evolution. And this is a journey. This is not something you do in one day or three days. Uh, this is something that you work on to achieve what Robert Keegan would say, global mind level five. And today we are in mind level three. And we're trying to solve complex problems with a mind that is not designed to understand those problems. So we need an evolution of mind to even be able to understand what we are confronting. So we need at least leaders in mind level four or level five, according to Keegan. The second one is emotions in generative language. Uh, here, evolutionary leaders work with this competency and, you know, and emotions now has gotten a great deal of support from the people like Daniel Goleman with emotional intelligence. We need emotional intelligence. We need to be able to work with positive emotions like love, compassion, kindness. And we need words that make us more human. We need conversations. We need cultural narratives that are more just and sustainable. And we have many examples of those um, cultural narratives that are evolving uh, for sure. Uh, in this country and in other countries. So that's a quick overview of what we mean by emotions and language. Unfortunately, a great deal of people in the United States are being influenced by the emotion of fear. Fear, as opposed to the emotion of, you could say, love and compassion. Uh, so th that's, this is a, a serious problem for us to confront. Uh, so power, what do we mean by powerful conversations? Well, evolutionary leaders with this competency engage in what we call powerful conversations. For sure, conversation for relationship with other humans, dialogue, uh, conversations for learning like we're doing today. Today is an excellent example of we are engaging collective learning. We are having a, and we are being supported by this great technology and the Anthony and his group. We are having conversations for possibilities. So what could happen today? At the end of this presentation, hopefully the people here in this group would say, wow, I see possibilities here that I never saw before. And then conversations for action that would say, what could we do together? How could we collaborate? How could we put our minds together? How could we make bigger offers? How could we have a bigger impact? How could we produce more results, action? And that's where the effectiveness comes in, but it's an effectiveness that's guided by purpose, by vision, by wisdom, not just action for action's sake. So the third competency is what we call systems thinking. And why is that? Well, you know, I study with people like Peter Sanger, and I'm the co-founder of the Society of the Organizational Learner. I'm a co-founding consultant since 1993. And we were teaching systems thinking just many years ago. And we need it more than ever, just like people like Donella Meadows said it, um, and other people 
uh, Jay Forrester. Um, we live in systems. So therefore, we need to understand a minimum four types of systems. Earth systems, uh, living systems, which is the biosphere, social systems, technological systems. And today, the technological systems are both wonderful and at the same time, very, very much in control of a lot of, of our future of our lives. So we need to understand how to design those technological systems so they work for humanity, they don't work against humanity. Uh, and an example of this technological system may be uh, the guy in North Korea, the president of North Korea, he's got ability to create atomic weapons and ICBMs, and he could possibly destroy the lives of millions of people. You know, how do we get into that situation? How do we get into a situation where a crazy person can uh, threaten the lives of millions of people with technology? So we need transformation. Uh, the other thing we can do with systems thinking is we can begin to redesign our system. Here's a quick example. Uh, so here in these three systems, we, you know, we, people like Paul Hawkins said, uh, I'm going to design a new type of capitalism that he calls natural capitalism, designing with sustainability. So do we have alternatives to current capitalism? Yes, we do. This is one example. Uh, could we create a more ecological culture education technology? Yes, we can. Could we stabilize our population and create more social justice? Yes, we can. Um, you know, it's when I was born, um, I, and I'll tell you when I was born, 1942, the population of this planet was 2.3 billion. Today is 7.5, 7.5. So since I was born, it's grown from 2.3 to 7.5. So if I say let's stabilize the population of 5 billion, so people go, really? Is that doable? For example, oh yeah, we were at 2.3 when I was born. And people don't know that. Anyway, it's an example. So this is a system that I designed. Say, we, do we have the are these doable, feasible, achievable? Yes, they are. Nothing here that says it's utopian. Another way of looking at a system is through this famous model called the iceberg model uh, that uh, people like Peter Senge and others created. Um, now, most people focus on the events and patterns that are visible and very few people go deeper into structures, mental models, and then what I call the narrative. So I added uh, to the original model of the iceberg, I added two layers, uh, the bottom two layers, uh, the mental models, the worldviews. Uh, I'm sorry, I added the narratives and the cultures. Um, and then because we are linguistic humans who live in narratives, and we also live with human natures. So we need to take into account the biological human natures that influences our cultures and our worldviews, et cetera. So this is an example of how we can have access to what drives human beings to do what they do uh, and to understand the systems that we have created, whether it is a social system, a government, et cetera. The bottom line is that, as Donella Mero said, uh, she said the biggest leverage point you could have is to intervene in the mental model of a system or a leader. And I would also say intervene in the narratives. So uh, here we come to this fifth uh, competency that I call systemic sustainability. And I, I came to this conclusion, and here I was definitely influenced by great colleague, uh, John Ehrenfeld, uh, who wrote a book um, on sustainability by design and flourishing. And Ehrenfeld was one of the first people who began to criticize sustainable development uh, as not being enough to get it 
get us out of the mess with, that we are in. And he said, no, we need to have ethics and we need to have ecology and we need. So this systemic approach to sustainability says that we need to look at the sustainability of humans, of people, of environment, and institutions. And here institutions have a bigger role to play in the caring of the human sustainability and the environmental sustainability, which unfortunately most institutions are just not doing enough. They're just beginning to do that. And a lot of them say, oh, that's the work of the UN or that's the work of NGOs. Uh, so and to, to give a more systemic approach to human sustainability, I draw from the work of uh, Professor Manfred McNeef, uh, Chileno, uh, from Chile, and he says, we humans, to be sustainable, need to have these nine basic fundamental human needs. Uh, we need substances, understanding, protection, affection, identity, freedom, participation. And I really like this one, leisure. Americans don't have enough leisure. Most people are too busy working, trying to make ends meet. And for sure, we don't have enough time for creativity. So, um, so those are fundamental to being able to take care of human sustainability. And I tend to think that unless we take care of the human sustainability, we're not going to have a good chance of dealing with the ecological sustainability. Because if the humans are hungry, they will eat everything. That's just their nature. So we need to make sure that humans are sustainable. Uh, the, the sixth, uh, no, I'm sorry, the fifth one, uh, ontological design and uh, ontological designing is, is the conscious design of the mind and becoming human by design, becoming, evolving our minds. Uh, and ontological design is being conscious that everything could be designed with ethics and sustainability and paying at attention to the systemic consequences that we design, which unfortunately the industrial age did not pay enough attention to. So we are paying the consequences of things that were designed like plastic bottles, garbage bags, cars, pollution, CO2. Those were all products of industrial design uh, that we need to now redesign. Uh, Ontological designing also basically says that whether we like it or not, or understand it or not, we're all designers. And we've been designing for many, many, since we were uh, humans. Humans by nature are designers. Now the question here is could we be conscious designers of a better future? And ontological design is also recognizing that what we design comes back to shape us. So it's systemic. What we design designs us in conscious or unconscious way. So this is very critical to the design of artifacts, the design of products, cities, communities, economies, etc., cultures. So ontological designing is one of the most powerful concepts available to human social architects and leaders. We all need to become um, designers in this sense. In design technology, we can design artifacts, we can design uh, constitutions, human rights, a new mind, etc. So, and here's a example of a Stanford Social Innovation Review that says the new science of designing for humans. Um, so here's the sixth one, and I'm almost done. Um, with this one is the one that says, if we are going to redesign cultures, worldviews, and institutions by nature, uh, we would then say the challenge in front of us is an adaptive challenge. And this is where the work of Professor Heifers has a great deal to contribute because what most leaders try to do is to solve a complex problem like an adaptive challenge in a technical way in a technical solution that they think they already have the answer. 
And in an adaptive challenge, you have to confront that you need new knowledge, new learning, changing values. So if we're gonna design an ecological culture, it's a change in values or a sustainable business or a sustainable organization, a sustainable society. And so the biggest problems that are facing our world today in humanity are adaptive challenges, not technical challenges. And the mistakes that we make is that we treat an adaptive challenge, for example, global warming as a technical challenge. So here we are in the seventh competency and we talk about wisdom in desirable futures. Now here's an example of a book that I really recommend, I really like. Uh, 45 global thought leaders share their vision for a more sustainable and desirable future. So do we have uh, better visions for the future than we have today? Yes, we do. Uh, and in this book, for example, people like Donella Meadows, Paul Raskin, and many other great evolutionary thinkers have contributed uh, great visions of a desirable uh, future. So I highly uh, recommend. The problem with the book itself is that you need people to commit to put it into action. You need leaders who can take this vision and say, oh, how do we put this to action? Otherwise, the book doesn't do anything. So how do we create sustainability in business? For example, uh, we can influence our society with different types of organic and recyclable resources. Uh, we can do a green economy with processes and products. We can create renewable energy for a planet like people are doing in Denmark and people are doing in the US and other countries. And we can take care of nature by producing zero waste, no more plastic bottles in the ocean, in the Pacific or toxic waste. Uh, how do we design a sustainable organization? Um, well, we, we have to take a look at, in most cases, people, planet, profit, and see what can we do to influence uh, an organization in terms of their people. What do the people do in that organization? Uh, how do they live? How do they work? Uh, do they live in sustainable communities? Um, how do we take care of planet? Uh, so if you were looking at somebody like, uh, for example, Unilever, you know, a big corporation. How do they deal with their fisheries, uh, the forestry? How do we deal with agri uh, agriculture? Uh, zero waste. Uh, how do we deal with uh, corporations who are impacting the planet? And how do we deal with profit, uh, et cetera? How, uh, and are we focusing on qualitative growth as opposed to just quantitative growth, which is what we have today in terms of capitalism? Um, and then here are some list of quick values in terms of designing a new culture. Uh, so these are both and. Uh, so we want to go from, for example, um, the tribal mind to the global mind, from knowledge to wisdom, from mechanistic to organic, from quantity to quality, from control to collaboration, from ego to being, from separation to integrity and unity, and from hierarchy to networks. I'm sure you can add many more. So this is just a partial list of how we can design new values for a new culture. And here we have the 17 United Nations developing goals in case somebody says, well, uh, I'm not sure where I can contribute or where we can bring sustainability or how does my work connect. This is just to have a big picture of the future. So for some people, they say, well, uh, we want to deal with uh, eradication of poverty. For some people, it would be energy, uh, the, the ocean, um, uh, climate action, um, et cetera. Um, so there's plenty of work and plenty of opportunities for people to contribute. And then finally, uh, all of these uh, competencies and working together requires collective learning. It requires learning to create sustainable societies. Uh, here we have learning, science, systems, and I'm sure you can add other um, things to a, a systemic 
capacity for leaders to impact and design a better future. With that, I'd like to pass it on to Fyodor. Fyodor? Yes. Thank you. you are. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> That's kind of messy stuff. Um, yeah, thanks. And Manuel, I will ask you then to uh, you know, show a few other slides as well. Okay. Uh, okay, good. So I will do my very best to be brief, uh, and I'm not going to explain the whole thing. It's just kind of a visual uh, that might help you uh, ground uh, what I say in some, some things. Um, uh, yeah, so this is kind of a very uh, internal stuff that uh, is not part of uh, you know, what we usually share, but uh, since this group is about business uh, uh, models, sustainable business models, uh, we thought that we'd share some, some of this stuff, uh, how it works at this moment and how we uh, are building it again at this moment. Uh, we're still experimenting with a lot of things since uh, you know, we've been through a process of evolution and still are. Um, so um, with all this stuff, uh, with all this uh, uh, competences and models and, and uh, um, uh, different uh, um, wisdom and knowledge, uh, so how do we make an impact through what we do? Um, uh, using, uh, and also, you know, how can we make it financially sustainable as well? Um, so our main revenue streams come, comes from organizational work. And uh, uh, so we can see this green, big green arrow, um, you know, uh, in the bottom. Uh, and uh, our basic services are consulting, training, and stakeholder engagements. Uh, because when you, you know, help client, even when you do consulting, you know, uh, often you cannot um, do this without at least consulting the client on how to host a stakeholder engagement. Um, so, and we uh, uh, team up with strategic partners uh, because we have very limited um, uh, capacity as uh, far as large projects are concerned. So we hire contractors and we also work with strategic partners. And also we uh, use strategic partners to, uh, to, to get work uh, because um, uh, what we're looking for ideally is uh, um, uh, big systems with a lot of resources uh, realizing that uh, they cannot continue the way they, they used to work. Uh, so one example, and this is, you know, for me personally, is kind of uh, uh, the most vivid because uh, uh, there is this, like uh, this, the strictest deadline now. I'm in the middle of, uh, you know, uh, shipping the deliverables. Um, uh, so basically, we work with uh, the city of Qingdao in China. It's uh, one of the biggest ports in China. But we don't work with the city directly. It's not our client. It's a client of our strategic partner, um, that, which is a Chinese uh, company from Qingdao. And they understand what we do and what we offer on the one hand. And on the other hand, they have the capacity to um, um, uh, you know, pitch it to the client and also organize the logistics of the work and take on you know, a lot of uh, uh, technical stuff that we don't uh, uh, simply wouldn't be able to carry. Um, so we have uh, strategic alliance agreements uh, with our strategic partners, which uh, allows us to sell complementary services and uh, hire each other as subcontractors. Um, and uh, you know, with this particular project, um, uh, we are delivering a pilot, uh, which is uh, which will hopefully be part of a larger thing. Um, as you probably know, in China. Um, they don't have cheap labor anymore. Um, and uh, uh, that's why they, they have to promote entrepreneurship and innovation, which is also part of the uh, global trend of automatization and uh, uh, you know, elimination of jobs and things like that. So in China, they realize that um, on, on, on national level and on uh, province level and city level as well. Um, and on the other hand, um, uh, China is very big in sustainability now, they, so they really uh, set ambitious goals, especially on the city level. Uh, so Qingdao is a sister city of San Francisco. That's how I got connected with them uh, through uh, the ceremony with Mayor Lee and Mayor of Qingdao uh, signing all these uh, documents. And uh, I, I noticed that, that, that they have these uh, goals of uh, sustainable goals. They want Qingdao to be one of the biggest, uh, most sustainable port cities in the world. Um, and um, uh, basically, they don't see the connection between the system of innovation uh, that they're creating, which is human sustainability, right? So they want people to have uh, um, food and, uh, you know, income and things like that. Um, and on the other hand, uh, uh, the environmental sustainability, 
that they just call simple sustainability. Uh, so our offer to them is to help them develop an ecosystem of social innovation um, and also skills and capacities of different stakeholders in the city system so that they, uh, um, they design it uh, towards systemic sustainability, not separately for um, um, you know, driving people out of uh, uh, unemployment and poverty on the one hand, and then um, you know, run big government projects for to create you know sustainable port on the other hand. So, how to combine the two, and how to uh, design a culture, and also um, uh, designing institutions in a way that it would be able to. Uh, produce uh, results towards systemic sustainability. Uh, uh, again, so this is uh, something that uh, uh, more and more organizations for, uh, and systems and, and governments are uh, becoming open to. Uh, so and that's kind of the core of our consulting work that is in development. So we're still uh, in the very early stage of um, identifying the parameters of the project and uh, developing model for that, but that's, that's where we are. Uh, so uh, these strategic partners um, come um, from different sources, uh, but uh, um, uh, this is the uh, kind of business-to-business uh, -business work, and that's the main revenue stream. So that's uh, training, consulting, and uh, stable engagement. Uh, well, but uh, we are not just uh, business, so we cannot just focus on target customer segment and uh, you know make money on that. Uh, we um, you know, we're looking at different ways we can create impact and we can uh, spread this knowledge to enable more people to do that on their own. Um, and that's why uh, from the very beginning, we've been in, um, offering courses and seminars and workshops uh, just to individuals uh, who want to engage uh, in evolution leadership from different levels, where we, wherever they are. Because evolution leadership is not connected to institutional power. Um, anybody can, can do this work. Um, and we've been doing these workshops and it was very important for us to make them accessible for people. So that's why we offered uh, pay what account scholarships to everybody who requested that. And in the meantime, um, we've been inviting some guest teachers uh, who are really amazing, like Katya Laszlo, for example, um, uh, professor at Saybrook University and long, long time friend and collaborator of Manuel's and uh, Peter Stonefield, um, uh, who is a uh, uh, corporate psychologist in the Silicon Valley has been uh, doing amazing work over the last 20, 30 years there. Um, like Ken Homer, uh, president of Society for Organizational Learning Bay Area. So, and uh, because we offered scholarships to a lot of people, we could not predict the revenue from workshops. Uh, so, and that's why the agreements we had the, with the teachers were just, you know, they get um, um, a fair percentage of the revenue. Uh, but uh, um, sometimes we had like $3,000, sometimes we had $100, right? And uh, we thought it was unfair for, to, to the teachers to, you know, uh, treat them that way. Uh, so we were trying to, but at the same time, we could not, uh, uh, we could not afford sponsoring those engagements and we could not, uh, um, we didn't want to exclude people. Um, so uh, what we designed uh, with uh, some of our teachers and some of our um, uh, mo most eager learners is a cooperative community. Um, that is a learning community. Uh, so basically it's, um, uh, it's an on-demand workshop uh, cooperative uh, at the basis of it. And uh, we're incubating it on the basis of our li limited liability company, uh, but we intend to um, register it as a standalone cooperative when it's ready. Uh, so basically, members contribute with flexible membership dues uh, every month, anything above zero. Uh, so we can literally pay like one cent and apply towards 100 years of membership, so complete financial inclusion. Um, and uh, uh, at the same time, uh, members of the community can teach as, 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 as teachers, what they used to, to be guest teachers, now they're just community member, community teachers. And uh, whenever, whoever teaches uh, cannot request less than $130 an hour for their teaching. So if the community doesn't have money to finance this workshop, it's not happening. Uh, but uh, um, uh, so in this way, but at the same time, there are people who contribute like $50 a month. There are people who contribute $1 a month, right? And they have same access. So we have community funds and on-demand workshops uh, that, we, uh, that we finance so that teachers can be well paid and uh, um, everybody could have access to learning. Uh, everybody uh, can join the community uh, and it's accessible, but if somebody is not a member of community, uh, they, can, uh, they, they can attend most of these workshops for market trade. So 
this is how community also gets some revenue from non-members. Um, so uh, that is the, the basic mechanisms and we solve that problem of, uh, uh, you know, uh, inclusion versus um, paying teachers well. And uh, through that, um, uh, basically we, um, uh, we encourage people to share their knowledge with other community members and because Manuel's model is just a framework and we have a lot of core content that we teach, but we also invite others because a lot of things and models and, and theories are being developed around the world. Um, uh, so we invite people to join and to teach what they teach best. Um, um, that is also a kind of a talent pool um, that we are looking into in the first place when we work on the consulting and training projects. So we um, uh, bring people, again, we know through these uh, community engagements, we know uh, what people do, what they teach and what their expertise is. We see them in action and then we invite them to work with us. Um, so uh, recently we've been developing a trainer certification program for those community members who would like to teach our core content because they can, they can teach what, what they teach best. But if they want to learn from us and uh, learn, uh, uh, you know, what, what Manuel has been working on over the last 20 years and then teach that, uh, that's trainer certification pro uh, program. Um, so uh, then trainer certification program also uh, delivers, uh, um, you know, trains teachers and mentors for uh, evolutionary leadership fellows, uh, which is uh, um, a program for uh, individual projects uh, that are evolutionary projects. And that is also something that would help with consulting because uh, one problem that we have is that evolutionary work is not a, is, is not a, a very, um, you know, kind of uh, well-recognized term, nobody knows what it is. Um, and adaptive work, for example, nobody knows what it is. Um, and, uh, um, you know, it's, it usually takes, uh, takes a while to communicate uh, what's, uh, uh, what addressing root causes and social innovation really is, uh, rather than providing technical solutions. Because most social entrepreneurship, for example, uh, is, 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 is pushed into the technical solution field just because of the, how impact investing is organized these days. And that's one of the um, interesting issues that, that the conversations that's going on right now with here in the Bay Area. Uh, so uh, we want to highlight evolutionary work. And um, it's interesting that, for example, uh, you know, there are projects that are evolutionary by nature, but because of the ontological design of these uh, cultures and institutions we're in, uh, people uh, uh, don't have space to, to, to talk about the evolutionary side of their projects. For example, this project Regen Villages by James Ehrlich. Um, uh, so uh, I've been following this project uh, over the last couple of years, and it's been amazing uh, uh, kind of to hear all these uh, visions for regenerative villages that can produce all food and uh, energy by themselves. Uh, but everybody wants to hear the technical side of it. How will it work technologically? Um, and generally, the, the, this project uh, has an evolution vision. And it connects to the trends that the population grows um, and uh, uh, the climate change is taking uh, momentum, right, in a negative way. So we would not be able to, to live in cities anymore, just like we live now. Uh, so this is an, an evolution of future in which we, we have capacity to spread a little bit uh, and live in, in self-sustaining villages. And uh, this would require a lot of change in cultures, institutions, and mental models. And how do we approach that? Uh, so, uh, and usually again, if you uh, participate in a business competition or if you pitch your project to government, uh, usually they want to know the feasibility, you know, the technical part of it, but not the evolutionary cultural part of it. So that's... Sure, take another minute. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, um, so uh, that's why we want to highlight this, uh, uh, th this evolutionary part of it through Evolution of Future Challenge and take these projects incubate them in the Evolution of Future Fellows uh, with help from trainers uh, uh, developed uh, from community members. Um, and then uh, we hope that this project will attract uh, more large-scale work on consulting, uh, in, the, in consulting. Um, and uh, also some of these projects might grow into, uh, you know, meso engagement as, as, as Peter called it in the chat. So, and uh, the last 30 seconds, Manuel, can you give me another slide, please? Uh, yes. Yeah, right. So this is Evolution of Future Challenge. Uh, so if you want to join, uh, it's uh, absolutely free to join online, uh, watch live streams of the presentations and uh, engage in some generative conversations. 
And um, uh, I think Andrew, uh, oh, Anthony will probably send you this, the, this PowerPoint slide, so you will see the finals there. So Manuel, if you can um, go all the way to the last slide, please. Yeah, so the, here are just some of the finalists, so you keep going until you reach the final slide. Yeah, so these are some of the evolution projects that we selected for the challenge. Yeah, and these are the competences again. And, uh, oh, the, the presentation highlights and competences. Okay, so with that, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope that um, um, you, uh, it's helpful for those of you who would like to understand um, how this, uh, you know, one way to apply what Manuel was talking about um, in practice. Thank you. So, uh, thank you very much. That was a, a, a really good uh, overview of uh, your perspective on competencies for, for leadership in, in, the, in what we would call the strongly sustainable world, but uh, I think uh, the way you're using all the language is, is extremely similar to uh, many of the discourses we've been having here. Um, there are a large number of comments that have been made in the chat, um, and um, uh, I would perhaps invite some of the people who are most uh, vocal uh, in the chat to, uh, now that the presentation is complete, uh, to reflect on, on what parts of their comments are still useful and perhaps speak out loud and, and uh, share some questions. Um, otherwise, uh, perhaps while people are thinking about that, uh, Manuel and, and Fedor, would you like to just scroll through the chats and pick out a few that uh, you find particularly provocative and uh, are worth commenting on. How do I go to the chat, Anthony? Uh, go down to the bottom and uh, click on chat. <laughs> okay, I, I can ask uh, one of them because it's probably the most recent. So if you're scrolling through, Manuel, this is Peter Jones. I, I wanted to, to uh, I, I noticed a lot of the, um, the, the presenters in um, you know, the October 9th event, which looks really cool. Uh, a lot of them are, are, have maybe more, have social innovation projects, or you might call them that. And I'm wondering, what are the sectors, industries, or different um, kind of mainstream areas that are starting to find um, a listening for? Is there, are there, are there some surprising breakthroughs in, in industries that we might not have expected to be um, you know, receptive to the, you know, the, the kind of vanguard of evolutionary thinking. Uh, Manel, do you want this to... You, you can take that, Peter, if you want. Yeah, just, yeah, because I was, uh, uh, you know, uh, carrying out uh, the analytical, the logistical part of it. Um, uh, yeah, that's a great question. So one interesting thing is that uh, there is no one project that is governmental yet even though we work with the city <laughs> with the Evolution of Future Challenge. Uh, and there is some thinking, I think, that to be done around that. So why don't we don't have any governmental projects? Uh, even though among the judges, we have uh, people from government and uh, nonprofit sector and um, business sector. Uh, so in, around industries, um, it's um, uh, a surprising thing is that impact investing is really, it really feels like impact investing is looking for ways because people realize that the way they invest in, um, in social innovation is not working quite well. And uh, uh, there is a larger context in that. There are certain conversations that are going on. Um, you know, happy to talk with you one-on-one -on -one later to, to, to give you details. Uh, but we have one, question, uh, one, one finalist who is working on exactly that, funding questions uh, instead of funding solutions. Because as soon as you ask somebody to figure out the solution before they have really time and resources to investigate and engage the system, uh, you are funding technical solutions. Right? Because there's well, almost no way people can bring up you know, uh, adaptive solutions. Uh, other than that, uh, um, f healthcare and uh, especially holistic healthcare, um, uh, people are naturally basically uh, thinking holistically about and systemically about things. They don't necessarily have the language. Once they learn the language, that they're, they're, they are very eager to engage, uh, to kind of leave their comfort zone and really engage in. Uh, uh, in, engage different stakeholders and uh, and work uh, on systemic level. Uh, that's the most receptive um, industry so far. Um, mm. Food as well, right? I would say food and health, food and health. 
And so other than that, again, you can just look at, oh yeah, and blockchain, of course, and cryptocurrencies, because well, it's a new thing and, uh, and forks are uh, folks are, are willing to think about redesigning society in general with blockchain. They're just thinking big. And as soon as you introduce uh, uh, some evolutionary perspectives to them, they uh, treat it as a valuable thinking uh, to stimulate their own thinking about how blockchain can, can create a better world. So would it be, that, that's excellent. Would it be fair to say, order that um, uh, people in organizations that are purpose-driven or have a larger purpose that, that, they, that they're looking for the leadership competencies to step up to the, to the, uh, the size or the, you know, the import of, of that purpose? Uh, yeah, but uh, but I would say that people who are like really radical at this point is early is still the stage of early adopters. I think so. If you just take a traditional charity, charity, uh, even that is changing a little bit slowly. But uh, no, but most receptive people are still those who are unconventional, uh, like Michael Sillen, who is on the call today, right? <laughs> so yeah, in Sweden, so uh, they are willing. So so they, they've already sacrificed a lot to do what they do. So they are willing to take anything that would uh, bring them closer to the purpose. They don't have, uh, you know, a, a, a good environment uh, that, 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 that feeds them that they are too attached to. And those people are very receptive now. But also just uh, I, I want to say that the mainstream is, is shifting as well. Uh, so I've been involved with the Academy of Management and over the last five years, if you see, uh, look at the topics, uh, they have capitalism in question, making organizations meaningful and all this stuff. There is a great group, uh, Alternative Economic Futures, started by former president of the Academy, um, uh, Paul Adler. And uh, uh, that is the uh, world's most uh, reputable association of management scholars with 18,000 members um, and uh, uh, you know, conferences where 10,000 people. And the entire topic of 10,000 people would be capitalism in question. Uh, so it's clearly um, the doors are opening. And uh, uh, yeah, but at the same time, when you want to start um, again, uh, there are some larger scale conversations that are not necessarily making them ready to 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 to, uh, to pay for work yet, right? Uh, because uh, because people want to know, but at least there is an openness to 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 know, to listen, and to try to figure that out. And, uh, and uh, those who are willing to just um, jump onto that and grab it and, 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 and uh, uh, digest it and implement it in their work are mostly people who have been um, uh, kind of uh, antagonistic towards the status quo for a long time and they're just willing uh, to, to, to take something that helped them do, do the work they're already doing. Anthony, is there a particular question for me? I mean, I saw a comment about competency assessment. Um, which, which wasn't from me, I don't think, was it? Um, uh, I don't know who it was from. Uh, it's from me. Sorry, it's on Dean here. Hi. Uh, uh, at this time, we don't have a, our own unique competency assessment process, uh, but there are many uh, ones already in, that exist in organizations uh, in the OD community that you can use. And I've used them in the past to, as you know, to influence behavior and results. So we don't have our unique one, but uh, you know, you are welcome to use uh, any of the ones that are more already being in use. So uh, we, you know, we haven't designed our unique one for ourselves yeah, yet. Yeah, we're in the process of designing. If you see the link, yeah. uh, so uh, we started with uh, kind of a very small uh, online uh, process to, mm -hmm. uh, to to solicit some general comments. Uh, so Michael was part of that process. Um, and uh, uh, we plan to, because we need to, 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 to assess impact of evolution or change, which is very, very uh, um, uh, difficult, right? Um, a lot of impact assessment metrics that people use now uh, well, they are um, uh, kind of very technical. Uh, at the same time, there is different kind of metrics that people in organizational development use, what Manuel mentioned, is a little bit different from what social impact uh, folks use, like in foundations or um, impact investors, right? And uh, the metrics that we plan to come up with will probably be a blend, and there probably will be some 
uh, qualitative and quantitative components of it, but we don't quite know yet what it will look like. And if you have any ideas, uh, please follow the link or reach out to us. We are very much looking uh, um, to, 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 to invite people to share their ideas and we're going to develop this metrics and share it with the world and let everybody use it, everybody improve in it. Uh, so it's kind of very open uh, collaborative project that is not proprietary at all. Uh, so we would love uh, your participation and input and, yeah. uh, and we're hosting that space. Good, thank you, Fyodor, that, that was great. Any no, other sorry. questions? Anthony, any yeah. questions or comments? Uh, the, the link that uh, you just mentioned, could you just put that in the chat? I just did. Uh, it's in the chat, and I can put it again in the chat again um, in a moment. Okay, thanks very much. Um, Andy, did you have a follow-up or a comment? No, I think it would be great to reach out. Um, we, Anthony and myself at uh, Lean for Flourishing are in the process of uh, looking at competency assessments for flourishing entrepreneurship. It's been uh, wonderful to, to listen to this presentation because it's, it's validated a lot of our thinking, which is uh, awesome. Um, in fact, some of your slides, we, um, we could have almost replicated with, with some of the slides that we're presenting at the moment as well. So a lot of uh, uh, contact points. We'd love to uh, have a further discussion with you all. Great. Glad to hear that. I'm glad that um, we are thinking... Uh, uh, in common. That's great. Uh, any other ones? Well, I, I was going to actually ask Michael. Uh, Michael's actually seen our work because uh, he was at a lab that I ran in Sweden in June. And I was wondering, Michael, given that you obviously know Manuel and uh, uh, Fyodor's work really well and you've seen some of our work, if you had any observations or comments having seen both sides? Yeah, sure. Yeah, we, done, we did your workshop in June and me and Janneke who run the workshop, we have done two consecutive workshops on our own exploring your models. And I think it's, it's, uh, it's, one, it's a model stuck one leg in the old world and one leg in the future world. And we came up with the, there, there are some things uh, not, uh, not in the model that really should be in the model. Okay. Uh, yeah, and... But also, it's a great um, it's a great tool for people who understand the old modern the old world. So it's a great transition tool. But there there can be some more prototyping and uh, uh, reframing of some of the things and add some of the things. Like a uh, uh, lot in the network society, we talk about uh, ambassadors and fans and how they are se separate but very important when you do your communication and everything. So th that's a thing we could add to your model. I would like to discuss that. We do our findings on our two workshops on that. And also I like the part that I was in the workshop last year with uh, Manuel and Fjordo when we did the uh, value mapping. And I talked to a guy in Copenhagen or at the Bertola also Institute that talked about the trust mapping. So mapping the, uh, like your model had mapping value flows and trust flows uh, be between stakeholders are a thing you can do on a, not on the same model, but um, uh, at the same time as it does as you do this model. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Yeah, and just quick comments. Uh, also, uh, what Michael mentioned is an event we hosted last year with our partners from um, Asia Pacific Social Impact Center at Melbourne Business School, uh, and these are my dear Academy of Management colleagues uh, who work on um, uh, uh, business models for social innovation. So uh, I'd be happy to connect you um, uh, with them if you want. And they have some groundbreaking research on, um, uh, on social entrepreneurship and how systemic thinking for uh, entrepreneurs uh, is essential if they want to um, make systemic impact. Like a project on Barnell when two founders founded four startups and were able to improve the situation with illegal logging, healthcare, and poverty because it was one system. Right, so there, because of a systemic connection between them. So anyway, so just uh, just uh, just that, and also uh, we are discussing with them collaboration on metrics as well. So again, happy to discuss details later. Could you put the link to uh, that organization also in the chat, please, uh, Fedor? Absolutely, I will. Um, and, and yes, I think uh, certainly Andine and I, and maybe others in the group, would be uh, interested in uh, in getting connected to those folks. Any, any other comments or questions? I think we have a couple of minutes, right, Anthony, or are we almost done? We just have a couple of minutes left, yes. We'd like to try and finish on time when we can. 
Uh, I have one, one comment too. too. I, were, I was in Copenhagen and Oslo and we talk about, about the impact investing and the measurements of startup and such. And there, like I can say there, there is a dire need for us for a model to people to map what they do like your model so we we really have to do that and scale this model thinking because they're using the old old canvas model and such and that that's not good even in okay. the impact world yeah okay michael yeah uh, any any other comment or question how many people how many people were, were able to participate today anthony uh, so we have three in the room today, and we have, uh, if you just look at the uh, wiki page um, for today's meeting, you can see a complete list of everybody who's attended. So it's uh, just over a dozen, maybe, a little less. How many? About a dozen. Okay. Um, which, which is a little lower than uh, sometimes, but uh, it is, it is uh, the, the first, week of, first full week of term, so I, that sometimes has an impact. Uh, but one can, one can never tell. But the recording uh, should, should be available to all 1,000 members uh, within the next uh, half hour or so if, uh, if the Zoom works the way I think it works. Terrific. That's, um, that's great, Anthony. Okay. So, uh, I, I'm going to wrap up by uh, saying um, uh, thank you very much to Manuel and uh, to uh, Fedor for presenting uh, this afternoon and for... Uh, I think starting to, uh, as you yourselves uh, mentioned, uh, building some bridges between two uh, communities that uh, uh, really do seem to be very, very aligned in, in where we're going. And I think uh, from what Michael's experienced of us practically, um, uh, both of us practically so far, uh, it is, uh, and the feedback you just shared is, is kind of supporting that uh, thinking. So I think we have to now think about practical next steps and uh, we'll, we'll ruminate on that and see where we... Uh, where we would like to take that. Um, Great, uh, thank you. So I, the, the thank you, Anthony. Appreciate your support, and thank you to the group and everyone. And um, looking forward to uh, future collaborations. Absolutely, definitely. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye, Michael. Bye, everyone. Bye, bye. Bye. -bye. bye.